settle in and begin to turn our attention to the Lord. We just turn our eyes, Lord. We turn our affections back to you, Jesus. Lord, may we settle in in this moment because we know that there's so much more available. There is so much more available. And Lord, we're hungry. We're hungry for more. And so, so we enter in, we enter in to your presence, Lord, with thanksgiving, Lord, with hearts that are in love with you, Jesus. And we say that we wanna see you. We wanna see you this afternoon, Lord. We wanna see you. We wanna see more of you, Jesus. Open our eyes to see, open our hearts, Lord. Open our ears to hear your voice. It's like David said, when you said, seek my face, my heart said, your face I will seek. So that's how we've come. That's how we've come again, Lord. As your children who are hungry. So Lord, lift us up, take us in. Holy Spirit, take us in. Holy Spirit, lead us again into worship. We long to worship you. We will never grow tired of worshiping you. So we say, Holy Spirit, come move and have your way and inhabit our praises, Lord. Touch your people, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen, amen.
Yeah, why don't, let that be our cry. Come, Lord Jesus. Why don't you say it? Come, Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, come. I pray you fill this house with your glory. Fill our homes with your presence, Jesus. Father, I pray as we go back to our cities and to our countries, that your Spirit fill those places, God. Fill those places with yourself, Lord Jesus. We say, come, Holy Spirit. Let your kingdom come and your will be done. Here as it is on heaven, Lord, we thank you, Jesus. We praise you and we love you. For you are worthy of every shout. You are worthy of every praise. You are worthy of every hand lifted up. It is you and you alone, Jesus. I pray the preeminence of Christ in this room today. We love you, King Jesus, in your precious name. Why don't we give him a sacrificial praise today? A sacrificial praise. Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we honor you and we worship you and we praise you. For you are good. You are good. We love you, Lord. You're worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy. In your precious, precious, beautiful name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. We're just getting started. It's going to be a beautiful day in the presence of Jesus. You guys can make your way back to your seats. Love somebody on the way. Let's do it quickly. Let's get settled in. Thank you, Lord. How many know he saves the best wine for last on this last day? I get the honor today to introduce Dave Papavisi, and he's going to, yeah, he's going to start in a minute, but... I remember I heard Pastor Michael say something as he introduced him a, a while back at church. And he said, Dave, you know, he, he serves in Northern Iraq with his family and for years now. And I remember Pastor Michael said that, you know, Dave merely didn't go to Northern Iraq just to see that nation set on fire for Jesus primarily, but he went because God asked him to walk with him in that nation. And and that's the man of God that Dave is. He's a man that walks with God. And I've got to see from afar over these past few years just the character of the Lord in him, the humility, the love for his family and for his children. To see the Lord in his children, the way that they love the Lord and the love him shows a lot. The stuff that truly does matter. You know, the authentic gospel flows in and through his life. I've got to hear it for years now. I have been pierced and marked by the words of Jesus in and through Dave's life. And it is an honor, guys, that we get to hear from Dave Papavisi this afternoon. So why don't we just welcome him and honor him as he shares with us today. Jesus. 
Thank you, Jesus. God is good today. Just ask the Lord to come and touch us today. Thank you, Lord, that you're here. Even now, Lord, thank you for what you've done this weekend and what you're going to do. We thank you, Lord, my God, that you've brought so many from all over the United States and even different parts of the world to reveal to us Jesus as the Lamb of God. Touch us today. Mark us with the truth of your word and who you are. Change us forever, Lord. Amen. I want you guys to turn to Hebrews chapter 4. Such an honor to be here again this year. It's an honor to do life and to see all that God is doing with Jesus' image, with Pastor Michael and Jessica and the Lord's smile that's upon this ministry and upon their family. You know, I know, I know we all think of Jesus as the Lamb of God. We all know that He's our sacrifice, that without the blood of Jesus, we cannot approach the throne of God. It's because of the blood of Jesus that we have confidence. The Bible says that we can draw near with confidence to the throne of God. But when we speak of the Lamb of God, we're speaking about who He is as a priest. We're speaking about priesthood. When we speak about the Lamb of God, we're speaking about the cross and Jesus as the King or the kingly way. When Jesus was crucified, they had nailed above Him a sign that said, King of the Jews. He will return as king of all the nations of the world. The Bible says that he is our great high priest, but it also says that he is the great king of kings and the Lord of lords. At the end of Hebrews chapter 4, the author to the letter of the Hebrews what happens, at least in the context of, of here in, the, in this church, is that many Jews were getting born again, and some of them started to deconstruct their faith and question whether or not Jesus Christ was the Son of God. And because sin started to creep into their hearts, unbelief started to harden the heart. The Lord speaks to them and, and, and calls them to come back. At the end of Hebrews chapter 4, the author to the Hebrews starts talking about Jesus as the great high priest. And we'll look at from 5.11, Hebrews 5.11. So he's, he's talking about Jesus as the great high priest and he is the greater Melchizedek. We won't get into Melchizedek for the sake of time. But he's talking about Jesus as a great high priest because when we talk Jesus as the lamb, we're talking about Jesus as the priest. Jesus is not only the great high priest, he's also the offering. And he says in verse 11, about this, speaking about Jesus in his high priestly role, about this we have much to say and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, like a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have had their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish between good and evil. He's saying that his desire is to speak more about Jesus in his kingly and priestly function, in his nature, in his identity, in his purpose, in his ways. But sin has hardened the heart 
and has made it difficult for the spirit of understanding to penetrate their minds. He goes on to say in chapter 6, verse 1, So then let us leave the elementary doctrines of Christ and press on to maturity. He's not saying let us leave the foundations of faith. He's saying let us build upon the foundation of our faith. He says not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God or of instruction about baptisms and the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. What he's saying is let's get past the cycle that we see repeated in the book of Exodus where God mightily delivers a people and they spend the next 40 years doing circles in the wilderness. And when he says, and this we will do if God permits, he continues in the next three to four chapters to get into depth about Jesus in his high priestly function. We don't graduate from these truths, but we grow in deeper understanding of who Jesus is. So let's turn to Revelation chapter 1. This will be our main passage for today. Verse 5. been so blessed by all the different words that have been shared this weekend concerning death to self, concerning embracing Jesus as the Lamb of God and His ways. You know, it's possible to live your life in constant up and down cycles. So many of the words that have gone forth this weekend have confronted just that. Jesus is looking to return for a generation that has, as we were just worshiping here a moment ago, that Maranatha cry on the inside of their hearts. You know, in the first century when Paul is writing what we know to be the New Testament, or at least large portions of it, he wrote large portions of the New Testament. There was such an expectation in his own heart of the return of the Lord or the potential for the return of the Lord in his own generation. It's one of the signs of revival in any generation. When God begins to pour out his spirit, there's, a, there's an acute awareness of the nearness of the Lord. And there's, there's a restored zeal and passion and fire that desires for him to come, to restore and to renew the heavens and the earth, to live fully in the midst of his people. And this is, what, this is why even this weekend so much of what the Lord is saying is it's time to leave behind the sin cycle. What, listen, you, you can be genuinely born again and live the rest of your Christian experience going in circles. But God's desire is that we press on past this and enter into a fuller understanding and experience of Jesus as our great high priest. This is what the book of Hebrews is saying. Jesus wants to reveal himself, the lamb wants to reveal himself to us, not just as the sacrifice by which our sins are forgiven, but the priestly and kingly way of living into which he is inviting us into. Because here's the news flash, that is, what we are that is what we are going to be doing for the rest of eternity. The rest of eternity. Revelation chapter one, verse five. Well, we'll start from verse four. Grace to you and peace from him who is and was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, he's the Lamb of God, and has made us into a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, 
To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Jesus delivers us not just from the penalty of our sins, but from the power of sin so that he would introduce us into a new family that he would immerse and baptize into a royal family of priests. He being our chief elder brother, we were, we were designed to function as kingly priests. Adam was a kingly priest in the garden. Eve was a kingly priest in the garden. Jesus is God's great high priest. And this is his desire for us. The problem is that often our minds are so rooted in Egypt that when we hear the word rule, we are invited to rule with him. We think about what it looks like to rule in the systems and the kingdoms of the world. For some of us, it's, it, it sparks some kind of a lust for power and, 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 and self-service. For others, it sparks in us a false humility that says, no, 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 that's not for me. But when we look at Jesus as God's model king, and when we remember that God created Adam and Eve in his image to rule the earth, when we realize that God rules over his people, but God also rules through his people. When we remember that when Jesus speaks to the churches, he says, to those that overcome, I invite them to sit with me and to rule with me forever. We need to redefine what it looks like to be a human according to the word of God. We need a redefinition of what it looks like to rule because this is God's design. We are created to rule, but we're created to rule as priests. Jesus Christ is the lion, he is the king. But the way he administrates his power and his authority in the heavens and in the earth is like a lamb. The way of the priest, amen? What does it look like to rule? We look at this picture of this cross. Jesus is the king of the Jews. Jesus rules through the cross. Kings carry crosses. In God's economy, in God's kingdom, kings carry crosses. And kings that are not priests are not kings. Peter quoting Exodus in 1 Peter chapter 2 says, you are a chosen nation to the church. He says, you are a royal priesthood. You are a kingly people called to administrate the kingdom of God in the earth, starting with your own families by recognizing Jesus as the great high priest and by living as a priestly people yourself. In fact, Jesus' authority as a priest comes from his self-sacrifice. Do you know where power comes from? The Bible says in Philippians chapter 2 that because Jesus went down to the lowest place, God exalted him to the highest place. True apostolic biblical power comes from going low comes from living as priests. You know the way that God sifts out selfishness from the redeemed? The way that he renews his image in humanity when we get born again? He makes them into priests. It's an invitation into a voluntary life of suffering. It has a way of slicing right through our motives right through our motives. God has created us for a purpose. According to a design, it's called the image of God. It's what sin marred and twisted. It's what Jesus 
restored by his blood and by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And it's who we're called to be. We're called to be a lamb-like people. Amen. It's the very opposite of the consumer gospel. A priest, by definition, is one who is set apart. Set apart for the purpose of ministering to the Lord. A priest represents man to God and represents God to man. A priest finds his or her inheritance in the Lord. The Levites were a unique people out of all the tribes of Israel. When every tribe inherited a particular piece of land that was allotted to them in the land of promise, the priest's allotment was the Lord himself. Priests are set apart for the Lord. A consumer gospel is a me-centered gospel. It's a come to Jesus so that you can get whatever you think that you need or whatever you want. The gospel calls us to behold Jesus as the lamb and as the great high priest, as the king who administrates his rule through his priesthood. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. You could turn there quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul talks about the, about the same thing in his ministry. He's writing to the Corinthians. And he says in verse 8, sarcastically, Paul is saying to, with, a, with a hint of sarcasm, he's, he's writing to this church that has a, has a misconception about Jesus in the gospel. In chapter 2, he says to them that he determined that when he came to them, he would know nothing amongst them except for Jesus Christ and him crucified. Then he begins to address all kinds of different situations in the church. From false teaching or misunderstanding about true teaching, to the way that they relate to one another, to communion, to the return of the Lord, to purity and immorality, to what church governance looks like. But he says, I determined to know nothing except for Jesus and him crucified. Which means that it's only through the revelation of the crucified Son of God that we can make sense of anything else in our life. The truth about Jesus is the way that we can filter what is real and what is not real. And in chapter 4, he says to them in verse 8, with a hint of sarcasm, already you have all that you want. You have already become rich. You have become kings without us. And would that you actually did reign and rule so that we could share your rule with you. He's saying, you have chosen to adopt an aspect of the gospel that tickles your ear. But then he says, for I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world to angels and to men. We have become, the, uh, some versions say, we have become a theater, a live theater being observed by principalities, angels, and men. Administering the rule of the kingdom of God as priests. And he goes on to get into a catalog of suffering. First and second Corinthians has several catalogs of Paul's suffering. Because that's what it looks like to be a lamb-like people. And that is the secret to real power. Second Corinthians chapter four, Paul says, death works in us so that life can work in you. He says, we have this treasure of God's kingly power, power that transforms situations, power that heals the sick, power that can raise the dead, power that can touch and mark nations. He says, we have this power 
stored in earthen vessels. And God, and God chooses to place these earthen vessels in live theaters of pressure. He chooses to send us into communities around the world into contexts of pressure so that we can live according to the way of the Lamb. So that the power of the kingdom of God can be released in a generation. We need the power of God in this generation. We don't need better strategies. We need the power of God. We don't need human favor and influence. We need the power of God. And there's one way. It's the way of Jesus. There are no shortcuts in the kingdom of God. Priestly people act as a point of contact between two worlds. The kingdom of God and the current existence that we live in right now, the earth right now. As a point of contact, that's what a priest is. That's what a priestly people are. The merging of two worlds, heaven and earth. This is the way Jesus teaches us to pray. Priests mediate. And we can see that Numbers chapter 6, the Lord instructs Moses to teach Aaron and his sons on how to administrate the blessing of the Lord as priests. To administrate the blessing of the Lord. You know, God calls Abraham our father in the faith, and he says to him, this is the promise, the unconditional promise that God gives to Abraham. He says, I will bless you, and I will make you a blessing. I will bless you, and I will make you a blessing. And this is the promise that each one of us enter into by the blood of Jesus and faith in his name. But what does it mean to be blessed by God in a consumer generation? Do we redefine the blessing the way the world does? Or does the scripture define what the blessing of God looks like at a foundational and primary basis? We're blessed by God because God has chosen us to reveal his son to us. And we're made a blessing by God launching us into our families and into our communities and into the nations of, of the world so that we would reveal the knowledge of God by living like he lived, by living like a lamb in the midst of wolves. It's a little bit different when we think about it from the biblical understanding of what it means to be blessed and what it looks like to be a blessing at a fundamental level. And this is what Numbers chapter 6 says. It says that the Lord says to Moses in verse 22, speak to Aaron and his sons and say to them, in this way you shall bless the people of Israel. Every day the high priest Aaron would rise and he would face the Lord. And after he faced the Lord, after he beheld the glory of the Lord in the tabernacle, he would turn to the people and he would bless the people. He himself entered into the revelation of the knowledge of God. God caused his face to shine upon Aaron. And then Aaron turns to the people and he speaks blessing upon the people and this is what he says. In this way you shall bless them the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And it says in verse 27, and in this way you shall place my name upon the people of Israel. In this way you shall place my name upon them. 
The way the Lord blesses us is by making his face shine upon us. When he unveils himself to us, he sets his name upon us like a seal. And then in the same way he marks us and he anoints us to reveal him and to set his name upon others. This is why in Matthew 28, when Jesus is raised from the dead, he invites his apostles, his disciples up to a high mountain and he says to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, so therefore go, preach the gospel, make disciples of all the nations, baptize them into the name. Immerse them into the name, the Father, Son, and the Spirit. He's talking about baptism in water, but so much more. When he's talking about making disciples, he's saying, you who have beheld me, you who live set apart from the world to minister to me, set my name upon the nations of the world. Priests mediate. We mediate the presence of God and the power of the gospel. We have the power to bless others because we ourselves have been blessed by the revelation knowledge of God. And again, he says to Abraham, I will bless you. I will reveal myself to you and I will make you a blessing. You will become a model within the theater of hardship and the service of others to reveal the lamb to the world. How many of you are interested in seeing the revelation of the Lamb of God in the nations of the earth? Lord, pour out your spirit. One last passage, Romans chapter 15. What does it look like to rule? It looks like going low. It looks like the humility of Jesus. It looks like serving others. Jesus says when he washes the feet of his disciples, I am the greatest one amongst you. He says, I'm the king amongst you. And yet I wash feet. A king is not a king if he's not a priest. Jesus is the great king of kings and we have been born again and given a new identity and invited into a new royal way of life where the highest way in the eyes of a world system that has been crippled by sin is rejected because it's the lowest way but it's the way of the king we're a priestly people. Ruling looks like governing our own lives well. Governing our own lives well. Our own hearts. We're not at the mercy of our feelings. We're not at the mercy of reacting to whatever season we may be in. Whatever crisis that may be happening, our own hearts are governed by the truth of God's word. It means like leading well in our homes. When we talk about ruling, when we talk about being made in God's image, Adam and Eve were created to be set apart for him, to minister to him, and to reveal him by ruling God's creation. We get all kinds of pictures in our minds. It stirs up all kinds of worldly, covetous ideas of what it looks like to be great. And, it, and, and that happens because we, we have not meditated enough upon Jesus, who's the crucified king. Jesus, who is still the great high priest and will forevermore. Do you know the Bible says he is forever the great high priest? making intercession for us. 
so that we ourselves would know him as he is and will become just as he is in the world? Amen. I think it's Amy Carmichael who said, if you want to go change the world, start by going home and loving your family. You want to be kingly? Go serve your wife. Go serve your husband. Love your children. You want to be kingly? Wash feet. You want to be kingly? Be content to be forgotten so that he would be made known so that you can become a canvas upon which he can paint the Lamb of God. This is the gospel into which we're invited into. And this is the way that God rebrands the image of God upon man. Last passage, Romans chapter 15. Paul saw himself as a priest. Close off here in a few minutes if Brother Brian will come up and share a word of life to transform and touch our hearts. Romans chapter 15, verse 15. We all know the letter to the Romans is one of the most, if not the most beautiful discourse and the New Testament on unpacking the gospel message. And this is the way Paul seals it towards the very end of the letter. He says on some points in verse 15, I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace that God gave, it, that, the grace that God gave me. Grace to be a minister of Christ to the Gentiles. God gave me grace to minister Christ to the nations. I believe God is going to mark even many people that are in this auditorium, maybe some that are listening online. God is going to mark you. I remember when God marked me, I had just gotten born again. I was 17 years old, the northwest side of Chicago, midweek service, in a time of worship, and the still small voice of the Lord, I will send you to the nations. It's been an honor to walk with Jesus in the Middle East. I believe God is going to send many so blessed by our dear sister Heidi's word this morning and the way that God has marked the nations through their ministry. Brother Yoon, so many other ones. I believe God is wanting to invite a young generation to take the knowledge of the gospel, the knowledge of the Son of God, revelation knowledge, the power of the gospel to the nations of the earth. The power of the gospel that is only revealed in fullness through a people that go low and live as priests. Through a people that are set apart to seek to know him and minister to him. To minister to his heart before anything else. To people who are first priestly and kingly in their own homes. In their own families. And this is what Paul says. He says, he's called me to be a minister of Christ to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God. Paul saw himself as a priest. He viewed himself as a priest. He recognized that he had been invited into something that was so much bigger th than him. He recognized that he had been set free from his sins by the Lamb of God. Jesus, the Son of God, who's both the offering, the mediator, and the great high priest. And that he himself was invited to live the Lamb-like way. The kingly way. In God's kingdom. Kings carry crosses. I invite you guys to stand. We want to invite the Lord.
next few minutes, we want to invite the Lord to come and to touch us. Thank you, Jesus, that when you were nailed to that cross above you, it said, King of the Jews. You are the King of all kings. Thank you, Jesus, that the way that you rule as the lion is by the revelation of who you are as the lamb. Thank you, Lord, that you created us in your image, Lord. And we can't make sense of life outside of the construct of understanding of who you are. That our life is meant to mirror your life here on earth to mirror who you are in the heavens. Thank you, Lord, that you have saved us. You have washed us from our sins. Not so that we would live and spend the next decade or 20 or 30 years of our lives going in circles in the wilderness of selfishness and a consumer gospel me mentality, Lord, but that we would know you as you are, that we would say yes to live a life set apart for you, to be a chosen nation, to be a, a royal priesthood, a kingly people. Lord, teach us what it looks like to be kingly. Teach us what it looks like to be priestly, Lord. We want to give our lives to loving you, Lord, and we, we, we want to give our lives in the service of others. Just turn our hearts to Jesus. Maybe we can have the worship team come and just minister to the Lord for a few minutes. Thank you, Lord. You have blessed us, Lord. You have blessed us. You have blessed us. You desire to make us into a blessing. follow you in the highest way even right now let's everybody just talk to the Lord let's just talk to the Lord and ask the Lord to touch our hearts today and let's say yes to him set your name upon us today Lord Jesus Set your name upon us, Lord, as a seal, the revelation of who you are. Mark us, Lord, with the truth of God crucified. Mark us with the truth of the lamb-like nature of the Son of God. Mark us with the truth of what greatness looks like. According to heaven's definition, Lord my God, mark us with the truth of where the power of the gospel is found. Mark us with grace, Lord my God, to say yes to voluntary suffering for the sake of the gospel, to not reject the highest way. Mark us, Lord, to be able to say yes, Lord my God, to the way of love, to the way of lowliness, to the way of ultimate joy.
Lord, we thank you that you are marking a generation. The raising of kings and priests. Steward what you put in front of us well. So we just thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the word of the Lord that you brought through your servant, Dave. We receive it, Lord. We receive it. Lord, seal it. Seal it in our hearts, Lord. Let it, let it become real to us. Let it become real to us, we pray. We thank you, Lord. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your word, that it is truly life. Your words are spirit and life. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we're just getting started here, so do not disconnect now. Just thank you, Dave. I don't know where he is right now. We just thank you for the word, beautiful word of the Lord, so anointed. So piercing, there is a generation that will go to the nations. And so we do, we just wanna, we just wanna take a moment and it, it feels fitting to talk briefly and to hear testimonies from some of our students. There is stewardship to this Christian life and as we talk about Jesus School, it's not just to talk about it to, to promote a school, but we really do believe it is the heart of the Lord for the generation to pursue Jesus, to know him deeper, to know him more intimately. Yeah, you guys could be seated. How many of you know what's taking place in this room today is it's not just historic, but it's eternal. There's far greater fruit that's coming from these moments. And we pray in the, as they, our students come up in a moment and share their testimony of what God has done in this environment. Um, I pray it touches your life. And if you feel that call to come to Jesus School, you feel that little nudge by the Holy Spirit, I pray we respond in quick obedience. Uh, so why don't we welcome our students as they come up here. Let's give it up for them, guys. And I would encourage you not to leave. <laughs> Don't check out, don't leave. We're gonna hear from Pastor Brian in just a moment. So just stay, stay locked in, stay locked into the Lord. Yeah, look, why don't, yeah, why don't we start with LaKayla? Why don't you go first? Let's give it up for LaKayla, everybody. Oh, yes, when I, when they told me to go up here and share my testimony about what the Lord has done at Jesus School, I literally went back to Dr. Heidi's session. I said, hell. Help, whoo, <sighs> but the Lord is so good, he's so good. Um, Jesus School, there's no place like it, and it's because the one who is like no other is there, and his name is Jesus, he's incomparable. What I found is that he fills voids that nothing else can fill, that he changes things that no one else can touch or change. He impacts us in ways that transforms our lives forever. And my testimony is I had a really fractured relationship with my parents. I didn't understand honor. I didn't understand love. And little did I know that without love, I had nothing. And so coming to the one who is love at Jesus School, he filled me with himself. And I'm able to now honor my parents, honor my family. I'm not able to have honorable thoughts towards people whom I know or don't know. He truly has transformed me and is transforming me because I understand that it's never a finished work. But forever, I'm gonna be progressing into the like-made image of the Lord. And so what I will say is, um, before coming, I was teaching, full-time teaching, fifth grade. And I felt like to say this, because like I said earlier, he is incomparable. There's no one like him. And as soon as I was getting ready to leave my school to come to Jesus School, the CEO of my school offered me $20,000 to stay at my school. And what I said is like, ooh, that's, that sounds good. But there's someone who's greater. There's someone's greater. There's someone greater, and his name is Jesus. And that $20,000, it pales in comparison to who I have met and who he is making me and who he is going to forever make me be. And so I would say come to Jesus School, but ultimately come to Jesus. Just as he fills this place, he fills that place. And he's filling a people for all eternity. So come to Jesus, come to Jesus and be transformed. Thank you.
Amen. And now um, I'm just going to hear for a moment from Tiara. Tiara has an amazing story. Um, she is in our first class that has been able to accept international students. So now we can accept students from all around the world, which is a major, major testimony in of itself. So Tiara, if you just share what the Lord's done and how you got all the way here. It's such an honor to be here. Coming to Jesus School has been an answered prayer for me. Um, I'm from Australia. My name's Tiara. <laughs> and, and I remember coming in 20, I was watching Jesus Image for years from Australia and from Sydney. And um, the Lord would just so meet me through the live stream there and just fill my room and I just remember asking the Lord to help me get there one day, that I would just be able to be in the room. And in 2019, I was able to come here for the uh, Jesus 2019 conference. And um, walking through the, through the doors, I still remember in this, in this room, this is crazy how it's happened. And the Lord, I would walk through the doors and I felt at home straight away because his presence was so here and is here. And I remember just interceding to the Lord and asking that if he could just make a way, because at that time international students weren't allowed. And um, I felt again by the Lord two years later to come back to the US. I saved the whole time I worked really hard and I saved money so I could come here and I stayed here for three months just to be here on Sundays just to be in church and the Lord so met me there I, I, I met him as my bridegroom and that's when he just made a promise that I would be here as a student and um, I went back. It was two and a half years of just contending, praying, believing that the Lord will open the gates for international students to come. And I remember it was April 5th and I was just, in, I was just crying in my bed and I was like, Lord, if, if you would just open that door, I'll walk through it no matter the cost. And the next morning, Pastor, Pastor Jess made the announcement that internationals were allowed to come. So, yeah, the Lord is so good. He's faithful. And since coming to Jesus School, like, there, there's no place like Jesus School. Whatever the fragrance that you're, you're sensing the Lord here right now and in this whole weekend, it's an extension of that. It's so much deeper than that even, because you have four or five days worth of just soaking in His, in his presence, because He comes there, He lives there. And you see the Lamb, and you see the cross, and I've never known the cross the way that I'm learning to see Him now. My identity is, our identity is in the cross, and I'm learning the love of the Lord through that. And it's my secret times changed. The way I'm seeing him, everything's changed. The scriptures, they've come alive. They've, it, nothing's the same. He's given me a new name. And I would just encourage you that you would ask the Holy Spirit and he will, he will answer us. He will tell us and he will make a way. Even, even when there was no way, he made a way for me. And I would just encourage you that if you're feeling that nudge, that you would, you would lean into that. And it may not be the most convenient time. It was not the most convenient time for me to come here. It was not convenient. As soon as, even though I was contending for this, it was not convenient. There was a lot of opposition just before. But we don't own our lives. We follow the Lamb. And if He's calling you, I would, I would encourage you to obey Him. Now, why don't we give it up for our students, guys? Come on. 
Amen. Like we said, if, if you sent some of these testimonies or just as this um, Jesus 23 has been going on, uh, we have a booth out there with all the information. We have amazing Jesus School students at that booth ready to answer any questions um, that you guys may have. We also have that information up on the screens. Um, so, yep, yeah, feel the Lord. Let's go after it. But uh, we have a lot in store today still. Are you guys excited for what Jesus has been doing already in the room and what he's going to do? Amen. So we're just gonna we're just gonna keep going after the Lord, and so I have the privilege to announce um, our next speaker, and he is truly family. All of our all of our guests they're not guests they're family, and Pastor Brian Garrett is man after the Lord's heart. I would say. Every time I've sat under the teaching of Pastor Brian, I have walked away, provoked to love Jesus more. And that speaks to his life after Jesus, the purity of his life. We've got to watch him over the last few years and Judah and Zoe are here and just watching the father that he is and watching him time after time after time weep in the presence of the Lord with a heart that just longs to know him. So I would say sit at the edge of your seats. Look at Jesus right now as we receive a true man of God, a true man of God that loves the Lord with all of his heart. So can we stand and honor Pastor Brian Guerin? Wow, praise God. You may be seated. Thank you, Lord. Man, um, such an honor to be here. What an introduction. Love Amy and Ryan, the whole. Can we first off um, give it up for Mike, Pastors Michael and Jessica, the entire Jesus Image uh, team? Yeah. Thank you, Lord. So. So thankful for their life. Um, I believe they had to be at Sophia's dance recital, which is perfect. <laughs> it's just parenthood. But I'm so thankful for Pastors Michael and Jessica. You know, they um, lead with such humility, authenticity. They never come off of the purity of the word and the presence of God and have impacted my life, continue to time and time again. Just so thankful for their friendship and leadership. And look, I would go to Jesus school after that. You got to just sign up and make, make room for it. But, um, okay, I'm really excited. I don't think I'll keep you guys too long. Um, have a couple of things from my heart, if it's okay. And then we'd love to pray at the end, and we'll just, we'll just see what happens. Um, this has been on my heart for quite some time, so sorry if this is redundant to some, but I've just really been feeling the Lord on uh, the crucified life. Uh, I didn't talk to Jess or Ben or anybody. It just seems like everybody's talking about it. But um, dying to self, you know, living that crucified life. Paul said, how many of you love that? This is just a perfect, okay, okay, hands went up. <laughs> this isn't one of those shout you down messages. But, man, I'm seeing it all over the Word of God, and I think Jesus is looking for a dead people. You know, Jesus can only shine in you to the extent in which you're dead. You know, Galatians 2.20, Paul says, um, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. M meaning, if Christ is fully living in you, then you're fully dead. How many of you want to die today? It's, it's biblical, it's healthy, it's really good, it's so freeing. You know, and Jess quoted so many scriptures where Jesus is also super clear about it. He says, look, if you want to follow me, you must deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. Um, if you love your life, this side of heaven, want to hang on to it, you'll lose it. But if you're willing to give it up, you know, you'll gain it. So if you want to turn to Isaiah 40, I want to start there. 
I'm just going to hit a couple of passages and then we'll land it. It's this new, um, I mean, this is how I see it, this, this new way that God's breathing upon his people by the Spirit. How many of you love the breath of God, the Spirit of God? Yeah, the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And, and we love it all. Um, for a number of years there, it seemed pretty prominent where the Lord would begin to move by His Spirit in a certain manifestation of joy and things like this. And He still does. All these verses are still here. We love this about God. But there's almost like been a shift in the gear of heaven in this last hour as the Lord's nearing His return. How many of you know a wedding super close? Yeah, and, and things, things matter more now. You can feel it. And so, you know, Galatians 5, it says, the fruit of the Spirit is joy. Psalm 16 says, in the presence of God is the fullness of joy, and His right hand pleasures forevermore. So all these verses are still there. He moves in this way. But it, it seems about like late 2020, the, the steering wheel of heaven began to shift, and it began to really highlight things like this, the narrow path, dying to self, character, purity, holiness, humility, the two H's, I'm really loving these right now, humility and holiness. And uh, His wind, the wind of God's beginning to hit this in a fresh way, and I pray here at the end the breath of God would come that I've seen recently from Isaiah 40 upon us. And um, it's so good. But yeah, so years we begin to see, and we still do in pockets, but I've, begin in, I've been, been beginning to notice that the Lord's moving His Spirit in ways like this, where it's posturing people's hearts to give their life fully over to Him. It's kind of like sometimes you ever have, they give you Novocaine before the surgery. So a lot of, I've realized the Lord's like, drunkenness in the Spirit breaks out in meetings. We love it. I mean, He still does these things. But I began to realize He was tricking us. <laughs> He's like, let me, let me get Him hammered by the Spirit for a few years, and then I'm bringing the cross. And he's been doing it, man, so I just want to encourage you. We're going to pray a different move of the Spirit here in a second. And if you just want the joy one that you can act like you're going to the restroom or something like that, I won't say anything. <laughs> but it's, this is such a pure way. And again, it's all scriptural. We love it all. But I've been seeing him shift because I don't have control over all of it. I just want to love him and follow him. And man, I've been seeing it in his word um, so much more uh, here lately. So to preface it first with first chapter, uh, first Peter chapter one, then we'll go to Isaiah 40. You don't need to turn there. First Peter, he says, look, you know, he's basically, I'm paraphrasing, but he says, look, since you've got born again, you're on the winning team, incorruptible seed. And he's basically saying, simply put, anything you do in the spirit and word is incorruptible. But anything of the flesh, I'm telling you right now, anytime you think you want to jump over to that path and operate in the flesh, it's corruptible never lasts. It'll burn up here and there. It does not cross over. So then he pulls from where we're about to go, Isaiah 40, and he quotes it. He says, all flesh is as of the grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of the grass. Do you all remember that passage? Does anybody read the Bible? Do, do you remember the, okay, <laughs> we're just doing the quiet, okay. Ooh, I'm teasing. Anyway, so love the passage. I'll, if I'm honest, I've read it for years, and I correlate it with just the temporary posture of mankind. We're, we're temporal. You know, all man's is the flesh of the grass. We come and go. We're not eternal. But Isaiah 40, this is where we'll go now, it gives us a different look into it uh, that I had never seen before, and it's really powerful. I pray the Spirit of God breathe upon us. I'm telling you, you want this. Just trick yourself into believing me for a second because this is the word. If we'll just all get over ourselves, he can shine. This thing, this thing has nothing to do with us. I'm telling you, may he, uh, uh, Galatians 2.20, Paul, he said, I have been crucified with Christ. He wrote that from truth. He was a dead man walking. I, I don't think I can quite quote that verse yet. It's my goal. But Jesus is only going to shine through us fully to the extent at which we die. This is just biblical truth. It's incredible. Um, what is it? 2 Timothy 3, I think, says, in the last days, there will be perilous times. How many of you know we're in the last days? 
How many of you are seeing the perilous times? Well, if you read further, you're like, okay, Paul, you know, in the last days there'll be perilous times. And he says, let me tell you why. Because men will be lovers of themselves. Selfishness is tied into it all. It's all at the root of everything. And may the Lord, by his grace, give us the ability, by his mercies, Romans 12, that we'll be living sacrifices. Pastor Michael quoted it earlier. But watch this. I love this kind of new slant to look at it from Isaiah 40. We'll start in verse 6. Isaiah 40, verse 6. It says, the voice said, cry out, and he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. Verse 7, the grass withers, the flower fades. Why, Isaiah? Because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. That's powerful if you stop a second and look at that, that. So it doesn't mean we just fade and all of our glory passes on because we're temporal. It fades and dies because the breath of God breathes upon it. Meaning God's breath also, yes, he fills us, empowers us, glory, we love it. But also, I promise you, and I love this passage is in context with John the Baptist, who we all know is flowing in the spirit of Elijah that always comes before the return of the Lord, the coming and return of the Lord, the spirit of Elijah. So I believe God's doing this in the earth very prominently right now for those that will yield, that will give their flesh over to him, say, breathe upon me, God. May I fade out. May all of my glory, 1 Corinthians 1 says, no flesh will glory in his presence. Help us, Lord. And when he finds yielded vessels, he'll breathe. And if we'll just die, his son comes forth. I'm far from these verses, but I'm like, help me, Lord. It's so beautiful. I'm just drawn to it. I'm really drawn to it. Like, Jesus, be glorified. You know, um, we'll pray things like, this. have your way through my life, Lord Jesus. He's like, I'm trying to. Please die. <laughs> Please get over you. This thing's not about you. You know, and I, I hear all kind of things. I've done this plenty where it's like, man, there's so much resistance and warfare. Like the devil gets, I feel like he gets way too much credit. And, and it's like, no, you're just super selfish. <laughs> That's the problem. The devil's like off tormenting some young kid in Canada. He doesn't know who you are. <laughs> just so much resistance. The Lord's like, just die already, please. Get over you. And so I want to pray here in a second that the Spirit of the Lord would come again. And it may look like joy. We love it all. But I pray he'd mark us in, in a fresh way to get over us. This thing's not about us. It's about his glory. And uh, another one I saw, sorry, I'll just start thinking about him, but another one I saw fresh, it was in John chapter 20, if you guys want to turn there, and um, I'll start landing it pretty quick. John 20, end to end of the Gospel of John, so powerful. I believe you could teach it probably a million different ways, but I had never seen it quite like this before. Again, just the Spirit of God breathing upon us fresh that we may die. So John chapter 20, uh, verses 20 through 22. We'll read it quick, and then I'll just tell you my, my sort of take on it. Verses 20 through 22. When he had said this, Jesus, he showed them his hands and his side, then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord, verse 21. So Jesus said to them again, peace to you as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he said this, he breathed upon them and, and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. So again, this Isaiah 40 correlation, receiving the Holy Spirit, but with a fresh grace to, to die, to go for this crucified life. Romans 12 Paul says, I beseech you, he basically begging. He's, he's like, I beg you. I'm telling you the key to life. Just please hear me. This is what Paul's saying. A man who is dead. He says, I'm begging you to present your bodies as living sacrifices, which means ongoing, perpetual. Every day we, we give up our life for his glory. Uh, by the mercies of God, thank the Lord. We can't do it outside of him. And you go, what, what does this produce? 
Paul, like, what, you know, what does this look like? He says, I'll tell you what it is. It's holy before God. It's saintly, set apart. When you and I present our bodies as living sacrifices, living, ongoing, we're living dead people for his glory. It's holy, the Bible says, acceptable, and it's our reasonable service. So it's so beautiful, but how I see this even in John 20 is the Lord resurrected, can you imagine, holes in his hands, in his feet, in his side. He's walking around. You know, I love the account where he's on the beach, he's cooking fish for Peter to restore his soul, and I can just see him picking up fish, and you can see the fish through his hand. Just, you're gonna be good, Peter. I'm proud of you. Just powerful, you know. And, but in this account, John 20, he shows them. This is how I see it. He says, look, boys, they're all excited to see him. He says, you see, you see this, right? Get a good look. Get a good look at this right here. It's been wrecking me, man. Whole, he didn't say, look at my new robe. Remember, I left the one in the tomb and I face, folded up my face cloth. I don't even know what new, new gear he had. <laughs> I said, pay, pay close attention. Look at the holes in my hands and this one in my side straight into my heart they're excited and he says as as the father sent me I'm sending you <laughs> sorry sound guys <laughs> but he I believe right there he marked them with this breath of God Isaiah 40 when he breathes upon you and he shows you his wounds and he sends you in that manner you're just different you get marked by the Spirit of the Lord to just give it all up. And I pray it come upon us in a fresh, fresh, you just wake up different. You just, you know what, this thing has nothing to do with me. You be glorified, Lord. Have my life in every way, every minute. This is where Paul, this is Paul's reality. Um, Philippians 1, he's like, look, whether I live or die, it's all Christ's gain. He was a dead man. He says, but actually, you know what, I, I think I wanna stay for your good. It was for other people. And um, is this a little too heavy for you guys? <laughs> okay, good. Just checking, just checking in on you. But this fresh breath of God, I think he's even sending in a fresh way uh, uh, with a great grace to yield our life unto him. And with where the days are heading, we need it, man. We need it. Look, I love the infilling joy unspeakable and full of glory. Do it, Lord. But may he mark us in a deep way to where we're just, we'll give it all up for him. You know, I can tell you, if we're not careful, and I've been guilty of this plenty, we, we think we go deep in revelations, the Lord, I mean, people going back and forth to heaven. But I'm starting to see the mature ones, they give their life up for him. Union is found in death. And so that's where it really, really starts to hit the fan. Um, another one, real quick, and then I would like to touch on Jesus as the refiner's fire, if I get there, and then we'll pray. I just think you can see the significance in the scripture just to undergird it, you know, with how important this is to the Father, is you see in the Gospels that the Father only split the sky three times recorded in scripture over his son. The Father, he, he broke open the heavens and spoke audibly to where the public could hear it three times over Jesus' life, you know, we'll just do it in installments. And um, the first one, I think, is Mark 1. I love the next one out of Luke 9 and then uh, John 12. But you'll notice every time the Father, I feel like he's in heaven and he's so drawn to and affirming public, publicly death. Every time and only when death is in the context, death to self, is when he speaks over his son. First time, Mark 1. Jesus goes to get baptized, which we know under John is the symbolism of death and resurrection life. And the Father booms out from heaven over his son. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. How many of you want the Father's voice over your life? My beloved son and daughter whom I'm well pleased. I want to encourage you. He gets excited about a life laid down. He, he splits the sky, essentially, and speaks out over you. And I believe it aligns us unto him in a true way as our Father in sonship. You know, we can know it here, but if relationally we aren't aligned to it, it's a, it's a whole different ball game. I know on paper we've been baptized into Christ, but are we Romans 12 living sacrifices? A lot of us, I was baptized into Christ and we quote Galatians 2.20, have the bumper sticker, the t-shirt, but we're very, very selfish. 
The life, this life's always around our conveniences and what's best for me. Selfish ambition. These are things I'm seeing throughout the Word of God that, that the, the Word of God annihilates so beautifully. Selfish ambition and envy. It says when those two are in the recipe that soon follows every evil practice. Uh, Francis quoted it the other day. And so, so help us, Lord. This is so beautiful. But the first time, baptism. The Father booms out. Second time in Luke chapter 9, we, we all remember Jesus goes up to the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, James, and John. Uh, Moses and Elijah appear. Jesus begins to illuminate in glory. And in Luke chapter 9, it gives us a little more detail as to what they were discussing. Like, why did Moses and Elijah come and talk to Jesus? And it says in Luke 9 that they begin to talk about his soon coming decease that he would accomplish. So death in the eyes of God is an accomplishment. It's not something you undergo. It's, it's an, a great accomplishment to give our life up. It's the perfect model that Jesus walked out. And so sure enough, the second time, they're talking about his soon coming decease that he would accomplish Boom, Father splits the skies again. My beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. And he goes a step further. He says, hear him. And I want to encourage you guys like to personally apply this to our life. I see it as a progression of death, even in the Lord's life, just as he deepened. He was a 100% man, and as he got closer to the cross, that a lot of times we want to be heard. Um, I can totally relate to this. But we aren't dead enough. God's not affirming, saying, listen, hear him, hear her because we haven't yielded our life unto death. Does that make sense to you guys? A lot of us, want, we feel like we have this great revelation and want to be heard, but God's like, no, don't, don't listen to them yet. <laughs> they need to undergo further death. They've got, to, they're, they're too much about them and what they're building and fame and all these things that my son had nothing to do with. Listen, Philippians 2 is so powerful. It says that Jesus Christ left it all. We, um, uh, Dave quoted it earlier, the end of it, but it says he made himself of no reputation. This is what Francis was talking about. It was so powerful. We are, if we're being honest, a lot of us are seeking a reputation. Jesus did the exact opposite. It says he left heaven, didn't consider it robbery to be equal with God, meaning he knew his deity, but he, he sought to make himself of no reputation laid the hold of a bondservant, which means a slave, a person with no rights. How many of you love to have zero rights in here? Nobody. <laughs> or you're not being honest. I'm teasing. But this is, the, King Jesus left it all, made himself, like he made it his intention to make himself of no reputation, and then grabbed a hold of the form of a bondservant, which is a person with no rights. This is why he was exalted higher than everyone. And we keep fighting for our rights and what's best for me and things like this. And so help us, Lord, by his grace. And uh, here shortly, I'm going to pray. And I just I pray a fresh grace come upon us, um, a renewal of the mind in these areas, of course, but there'd be a fresh grace to live a sacrificial life unto him. Third time, John chapter 12 uh, Jesus says, he's, he's about to undergo the cross, and he says, basically, he, he was troubled. I'm deeply sorrowed, the Lord said. I'm deeply sorrowed. Spare me from this hour, Father. He's praying. And then he goes, no, this is, the, this is why I came, death. Sure enough, third and final time, the Father booms out from heaven. Jesus says, glorify your name. This is why I came, glorify your name. And the Father says, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. You guys remember that? So I pray he would take us through this process of the crucified life that Paul talks about and be glorified in and through us. Look, you can go on, like, like Dave said, 10 years from now, deceiving ourselves, thinking we're going deeper into God, but true depth only matches the, the level at which we will get out of the way. You know, again, I pray the breath of God empowers us to do that. All right, I do have time. I'm going to go to Malachi 3, if you want to go there. Talk to you super quick about uh, Jesus as the refiner's fire. 
kind of one-two combo. We die, <laughs> and he, he burns everything out of us. It's really good. No, it is good. He's so loving and kind. And, and please always know I speak of these things by his grace, by his mercies. His loving kindness leads us to repentance, but thank God, godly sorrow also does. I love the full word of God. We need to get back to the severity of God, the fear of God. Behold the kindness and severity of God. The fear of the Lord is clean, pure, and endures forever. Help us, Lord. It's so good. So watch this. This is beautiful. I'll start in verse 1, Malachi 3. Behold, once again, it's, it's in tandem with the John the Baptist, Spirit of Elijah. Th this atmosphere is what's on the forefront before the Lord returns. Mountains made low, arrogance and the proud, lofty areas of men's hearts being brought low. The lowly valleys coming up high, the broken, the poor, the needy. Crooked paths being made straight, rough places smooth. But also flesh is fading and the glory of man and the flowers is dying. Why? Isaiah tells us because the breath of the Lord breathes upon it. So how many of you want the breath of the Lord to breathe upon you here in a second? Okay, and annihilate all the grass and glory and, okay, just checking. Verse one, behold, I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Here it is, verse two. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears, for he is like a refiner's fire and like launderer's soap. Watch verse 3. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And we'll stop there. So see, I, I love just the fullness of God. You have Jesus as shepherd, priest, king, bridegroom, friend that sticks closer than a brother. But I love Malachi says he's also a refiner's fire. And I want to encourage you guys, the Lord's coming in this way like never before, and the heat's only turning up hotter. And we need it. It's by His grace, His goodness. His, he's not angry. He, it's just He's pure. He's clean. And he, I'm telling you, when He walks near and He's coming through the church, if we'll let Him near, He's also coming as a refiner's fire and a launderer's soap. He's looking for a, a bride without spot or wrinkle. You know, this is Ephesians 5. I love Revelation 19, 7 says that the bride prepares herself and makes herself ready, and she's clothed in bright white, clean linen, clean. Bright, clean, and it's the righteous acts of the saints. How many of you want to be clothed in white without spot or wrinkle? Yeah, so you want the Lord as refiner's fire to come near. He's so good, and I love that even verse three says he sits as a refiner's fire, meaning he pulls up a chair near your life and just sits there. He's not going anywhere until it all burns out. Either you move or he's going to have his way. And, uh, and we need him in this way. And he's so loving and kind. His eyes, they're filled with love. They just stare and burn, and they burn everything out that's not, not in love because love rejoices with truth. If it's not in truth, it, it doesn't line up with the fire in his eyes. He just, I'm telling you, he's walking. I feel like he's walking the aisles now conviction. Hearts are starting to, I got to let go of that little fox, those song, song of Solomon too, those little foxes that spoil the vine, those sins that so easily entangle. He's purging the bride because a wedding's near. This is, dating season's long gone. This is, wedding's close. We, we need, and thank God by his grace, we all need it. He comes in as a refiner's fire, launderer's soap. The fear of the Lord is clean, it endures forever. And he's purging and cleaning by his grace and goodness. Um, I kind of see an overlap real quick and I'll pray. In Revelation 3.20, where um, the church of Laodicea, you know, he kind of rebukes her for being lukewarm. And the remedy is he says, I counsel you. How many of you can imagine getting counsel from the Lord? That would be incredible. We have the counselor like Pastor Benny said, and the Holy Spirit. But I counsel you to buy from me, refiner's fire, launderer's soap, to buy from me gold refined in fire. Where it's that fire, it's him. He is the refiner's fire. And also, what's the next one? White garments, there's the launderer's soap. 
He's purging and burning everything out and cleansing us. And look, it's definitely blatant sins. Thank God he's so good and gracious in these areas, but it's getting down to like, like uh, Ben said, gossip, slander. I was in Jude the other day, uh, chapter one, there is only one chapter. And, and at the bottom, it, it's so powerful. Jude, you can tell he's on like this holy rant. I mean, he's, he's burning. And he says, I'm telling you right now, uh, God is coming with tens of thousands to come at the ungodly. He uses the word ungodly three times in like one passage. He says he's coming to bring wrath upon the ungodly. He's coming with tens of thousands to bring wrath on the ungodly, the ungodly this, the ungodly that. And you're like, man, Jude, like what? Who are we, what, what's the caliber of people we're talking about here? And he says, I'll tell you who they are. They're murmurers and complainers. These are the things, I'm telling you, Jesus is so loving and kind, but he's coming to his refiner's fire and he's burning all that up murmuring, complaining. He goes further. He says also, you know, they use flattery for selfish gain. They just tell you great things about yourself because under it, they've got motives. Ulterior motives, selfish ambitions. Thank the Lord. How many of you want all this burned out of you? It's such a free life to, to be rid of all these things, yeah, uh, for his glory. And so I want to pray. We have a little bit, if you guys want to stand. And... Um, kind of that twofold thing that the Spirit of God would breathe upon us, give us a fresh grace to live the crucified life. And, and I want to encourage you, if you mean it in your heart, the Lord will definitely take you up on it. <laughs> life will start to change a little bit, but we need it. And uh, that the Lord as a refiner's fire would, would purge us. So don't have to do anything spiritual or whatever, but just focus on the Lord. Maybe put your hand on your heart. Thank you, Jesus. So maybe just wait on him for a second and just stare at the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for Isaiah 40. That your, your word says, the grass weathers, flowers fade, because your breath is breathed upon it. Breathe upon us, O Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. I pray you'd breathe upon your people. Even as the Lord Jesus said, receive the Holy Spirit. As, I, as the Father sent me, I send you. Come, Holy Spirit, touch your people with a fresh grace to be yielded vessels. God, thank you that Psalm 51 says, the sacrifices of God are a broken and contrite spirit, and these he will, not, he will not despise. I pray for grace in the areas of brokenness, humility, contrition of spirit. And Lord, we welcome you. Uh, into our life personally, but also corporately to the body of Christ as refiner's fire and a launderer's soap. God, come through our homes, I pray. In Jesus' name, touch our children, family members. Walk through every area of our life, Lord. Touch our eye gate, our ears, the motives of our heart. Burn it out, Lord. Flip our world upside down. Oh, great refiner's fire. Touch your people. Prepare your bride for your glory. Prepare your bride for your glory, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome. Love you guys. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, let's give it up for Brian. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We're going to pray, and then we have a few announcements for you guys. Lord, we thank you for this afternoon, Holy Spirit. God, we thank you that we can live this cruciform life. Holy Spirit, help us to deny ourselves, to truly pick up our cross and follow you. Refine us with this beautiful fire. Purify us. 
We love you, Jesus. Seal it by your presence. May this word be real to us. In your precious name, amen. Amen. All right, you guys, just a couple of announcements for you. We did want to um, mention to you guys our Vision Cup that is going to be happening February 1st and 2nd. You guys can look to the screen for more information. If you would like more information, you guys can head out to our information booth out there in the lobby. And as you guys are exiting, as we break for dinner, we just ask that you take all of your belongings. Um, again, tonight the sessions are free. Pastor Michael is gonna be speaking tonight, so it's, it's gonna be incredible. Bring your friends, bring the lost, and we can't wait to see you guys. And don't forget your children need to be picked up. All right, we'll see you guys. Love y'all. Hello everybody, Michael here. We're so excited. Jesus 23 is right around the corner. We're just a few days out. Thousands upon thousands will be coming to Orlando, Florida to worship Jesus to be healed by His precious hands, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to hear the gospel preached clearly on a daily basis, and for all of our lives to be changed in His presence. This will be our greatest gathering yet, both we believe spiritually and certainly in attendance. So would you consider sowing a seed? The Lord will honor you. There is no greater place to put or to offer our resources than into the hands of Jesus himself. And when we sow into the gospel, according to the words of the Apostle Paul, he writes, He who sows sparingly will reap sparingly, but he who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. This is the word of God. And so I want to encourage all of you, would you do something today, right now, to stand with us? Maybe you're saying, hey, there's a, there's a registration fee for Jesus 23. Why receive an offering? The registration fees don't even come close to covering the expenses for the venue, flying in all of the worship teams and guest speakers, honoring them, uh, the production, uh, you name it. It is costing north of $1 million significantly. So, would you please do something today? Would you give to the Lord's work? And uh, let me pray for you that the Lord would bless your life and, and really use this offering to glorify His holy name. Jesus, thank you for your mercy, for your love and your kindness. Thank you for all you've given us. Father, I ask you now to bless your people as they give to your work. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. You can use the QR code right there on the screen. Uh, thank you for being a part of our souls campaign you can actually also use text to give if you like god bless you we'll see you soon hopefully at jesus 23 bye bye